I was about, I would say, 20, 22. There were old people, there were young people, a lot of kids running around. It was a, it was a circus. Despite the crowds, police were able to find plenty of clues. Footprints made by a size 11 tennis shoe were found in the neighborhood leading to the Rasmussen home. Signs of an attempted forced entry were found on a neighbor's house. And pry marks were found on one of the Rasmussen's bedroom windows. Willard Sill was one of the original detectives on the case. Well, from everything that we know, apparently uh, somebody was prowling around the neighborhood. His uh, footprints disclosed that there were prints in other areas in the, that Rasmussen house. And uh, my belief is that he wasn't pointed toward any one individual, that he was just prowling and apparently saw this gal alone and thought that would be a proper place to enter and proceed to enter and abducted Evelyn Hartley. Do you think it was he was after the girl or it could have been he was breaking in and happened on the girl? Or? I believe that he saw the girl. I, I think that he could have seen the girl from the outside. So apparently he knew what he was getting into. Inside the Rasmussen home, a footprint made by a dirty shoe was found on the living room floor. It too was made by a size 11 tennis shoe. Signs of a struggle were minimal here, but somehow Evelyn's abductor was able to force her downstairs and out the same basement window he had entered by. Whatever happened outside the house happened at about 7.15. Several neighbors in the area reported hearing screams at about that time. Elvin Soderbach and his wife were in their porch when they heard them. Well, about uh, either two or three screams. Uh, and then the, 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 the last one was kind of choked off, uh, shot off in the middle. And uh, I thought uh, some of the neighbor kids were being punished or something, and but they taken in the house and closed the door slam. And uh, we let it go with that. Not thinking any more anything about it until the next day when we heard what had been going on. But the. It came from down that direction, and there were, uh, I turned around, my wife was in the kitchen. She heard the scream all the way through the house. It carried, carried that well to the, to the kitchen. What did, uh, what did it sound like, a playful scream? Or? No, it didn't. It sounded like, stop or get away from me, or that kind of a scream. You saw a car then at about 7.30? Yes, it was. Uh, an old sedan, um, dark tan, I would say, about the color of your jacket. Meanwhile, outside the Rasmussen home, police found more signs of a violent struggle. Aside from the pool of blood with human hair, blood stains were also found on the side of the Rasmussen home. One of them held the imprint of a human hand. From here, the bloody trail led around the corner to the Fantel home at 2310 Cooley Drive where more blood was found smeared on the side of their garage. Blood was also found next door on the southeast corner of the Eugene Downer home at 2311 Cooley Drive. The blood found here seeped into a window well and police believed the victim's body must have laid here for some time. When shown this, Mrs. Hartley told a reporter on the scene that she knew her daughter was no longer alive. Do you think Evelyn died right outside of that house? Or was she alive for a while? I have no way of knowing that, but uh, I would think that she lived for a while. Taken hostage. Right.
there wasn't enough. Did you ever get out to the house and look at the blood that was found? No, I personally didn't examine that. I feel that there wasn't enough blood to be fatal out there. Looks like she had a bloody nose. I was told that the blood on the house came from her nose. I have read those reports, too. So she had a bloody nose, someone slapped yeah, her. Yeah, That's how the guy got the blood on his hand. Could be possible. Could be some other bruise that caused her to bleed, too. From the Downer home, police and later bloodhounds were able to follow the trail until it vanished at the end of Cooley Drive. Well, I feel that she was taken by a car from the area. And that would be the case, I don't know, logical place to go would be south from that location. Over the course of the years, we had, or at the time, we had uh, reports from down south, the Goose Island area, heard screaming you know, in that area. By Monday, the newspaper had the story, and everyone in the region knew about the strange disappearance of Evelyn Hartley. Police had already begun bringing in suspects. According to the paper, a lacrosse man had spent the night in jail after his car was mistakenly traced to a suspicious vehicle spotted in Sparta. It was about 2 a.m. the same night Evelyn disappeared. According to reports, the car, an early 1940s model, was parked by the La Crosse River Bridge, but sped away when spotted by police. A check of the license plate traced the car to the La Crosse man, but authorities said Sparta police made a mistake. They had copied the wrong license number. Police were scrambling now. All known sex offenders were picked up and questioned. Chief Talbot of the Highway Patrol told the paper that a window peeker had been prowling the southern end of the city for nearly a year. Quoting the paper now, at one home, his leering face appeared at a basement window and he laughed at a woman who was ironing clothes and told her, I'm going to get you. The story scared everyone including the wife and family of Detective Sill. Well, uh, we were alone a lot of the time because he was working till late hours at night, and I think everyone had this fear of who was around or who the person, the guilty person was around, and our children were very much aware of it too. In fact, our 12-year-old son nailed all the basement windows shut, and, uh, things like that. As the fear spread through the area, efforts to find Evelyn increased. The Civil Air Patrol and a National Guard helicopter from Minneapolis were brought in to conduct an air search, while ground crews looked for anything that resembled a recent grave. Searchers even walked the sewer looking for Evelyn's body. I was walking that storm sewer from uh, the end all the way up to Farnham Street with the assumption that possibly she was down in that storm sewer. And you were in it? In the sewer itself. I walked that whole sewer from the south end of La Crosse up to, I guess it was Farnham Street. On Tuesday, the 27th of October, Thomas Hartley made a public appeal. Dead or alive, he wanted his daughter back. On Wednesday, the FBI was poised to enter the case. They would use the Lindbergh Law, Meanwhile, the reward fund was growing. By Thursday, a plan to search every car in the county was undertaken. Service station operators would check the cars when they came to get gas. If the owner refused, they were reported to the police. If the car passed, a sticker was placed in the window reading, my car is okay. The community interest in the case was intense. John Bossard was the district attorney and it became his job to keep everyone informed. And uh, there just wasn't really much to, to identify or to take hold of. And of course, I wasn't in the investigating end particularly, kept informed, of course, as district attorney. Uh, 